I want to start today by asking you to consider something. When you think about my generation and the generations that have come before us, and then think, how are we different? What comes to mind? Maybe social media, the internet, the difficulty to find a house, computer games. I wonder if any of you would have thought about our relationship with nature. And would you be surprised to find out that my generation is less connected to nature than any generation in human history? Studies have found that we spend less time outside than our parents' generation did, and we have less direct interactions with the natural world. Words and phrases that relate to nature appear less frequently in our books, in our films, in our music. Recently, the Oxford Junior Dictionary, for example, has taken dozens of nature-related words like beaver and dandelion and replaced them with words like blog and MP3 player. For many of us, nature has become something that happens a long way away, or that we watch on TV. And my gut reaction to that, my initial feeling, is that that's something negative that we're losing something, that something is missing from our lives. But I had to ask myself, why? Why does it matter to me? Is it because I grew up in the countryside? Am I just projecting my values onto others? Is connecting to nature actually beneficial? Well, the research certainly seems to show so. Numerous studies have found clear positive relationships between an increased exposure to nature and all sorts of positive health, health outcomes, including decreased blood pressure, lower anxiety, improved immune function, and reduced risk of cardiovascular problems. One really fascinating study took two sets of patients who just had the same gallbladder operation. It found that patients in wards overlooking natural areas recovered more quickly, required less pain medication, and had significantly fewer post-surgical complications than patients in wards overlooking non-natural areas, even though every other factor was controlled for. Clearly, interacting with, or literally just seeing nature, can have a profound impact on well-being. But, as I'm sure is obvious to many of you, it can do more than that. It can also foster a personal concern for the environment, an interest in conservation. But the converse of this is that as we as young people become less connected to nature, we truly are losing something vital. Something really is missing from our lives. And as a result, well-being and conservation are being compromised. I don't know about you, but at this point, I couldn't help but feel downheartened. Yet at the same time, something truly special is taking place at my school. This here is my school garden, a small green space, about a tenth of an acre, a similar size to this stage I'm on today. Yet here, for the past decade, students, with the help of really dedicated staff, have grown fruit, vegetables, flowering annuals and perennials, bushes, and even the odd tree. In my time at Gardening Club, I've learned to grow plants ranging from butternut squash to Brussels sprout, carrot to courgette, rosemary, to run a bean. We have apple, pear, bay, holly, sycamore, and silver birch trees, as well as gooseberry, budlia, rosemary, and blackcurrant bushes. We have log piles, two greenhouses, a garden shed, bird feeders, and even a small pond. And these components come together, and in turn, they provide food and habitat for all sorts of different organisms, including bird species, on the RSPB conservation red list. We've seen house sparrows, chaffinches, nuthatches, blue tits, great tits and coal tits, woodpeckers, slow worms, frogs, toads, butterflies, honeybees and bumblebees, not to mention the fungi and lichen which grows here. And remember, all of this life, all of this biodiversity is found in just a tenth of an acre just the size of this stage. And this year, some major changes have been planned for our garden. We don't know exactly what it will look like yet, but here's a rough projection. It is literally being tarmacked over 
and made into 14 car parking spaces. We were naturally upset. With help, I launched a campaign, speaking to over 100 staff and students across the school, writing to the council, and meeting with the headmaster. But I'm not standing here on this stage today to tell you that what my school did was wrong. They needed car parking. This was the most logical site for it. And in fact, they've responded really positively to our campaign. They've pledged a generous sum of money for a new garden. And when the building work takes place this summer, it will be done following our environmental mitigation plans. What I do want to tell you about, though, is what I learned from the campaign. It forced us to consider, why is this space actually important to the school, to the staff and students within it? Why does it deserve money being spent on it? Obviously, this space benefits wildlife. That is clear to anyone who goes there. But it doesn't just impact wildlife. It benefits us, most obviously those of us who go there every week to garden. But our campaign also revealed students use it as a place to de-stress from exams. And teachers go there to work peacefully in the summer. And when people found out about these plans, they became passionate, they joined our campaign, they wrote petitions, they signed petitions even, <laughs> and they wrote to the council themselves. This small space, just tucked away in the corner of our school grounds, had had an extraordinary impact on the school community. And it really got me thinking, if this space, if this garden can have such an impact on our school, why can't it work for other ones? Schools devote acres of green space for sports. But let's be honest, these aren't really natural. The only thing that makes them green spaces is the fact they're green. They're trimmed, manicured monocultures. And don't get me wrong, they serve an important purpose. But they don't come with all the other benefits of a real green space. Just imagine if every school had a truly natural green space, a garden like ours. And what if gardening, what if growing plants was part of the curriculum? just like sports. This needn't be difficult. One of the most amazing things about gardening is that it can be done almost anywhere. Space can be found around field edges, or in raised beds on concrete playgrounds. Or if you're a school with really little space, room can be found on windowsills, balconies, roofs, and even walls. And this, for me, touches on the other really remarkable thing about this, which is its versatility. Gardening really doesn't have to be formal flower beds, roses and rhododendrons. Why not grow pollinator-friendly wildflowers, trees, or even fungi? But whatever you choose to grow, simply by getting out there, into the garden, growing plants, a huge impact can be had on student welfare. Gardening is just profoundly good for you. It encourages people to get outside, to be active, to eat fruit and vegetables. In fact, its impact on well-being is so well documented that some GPs have started prescribing it to their patients. But perhaps even more importantly for schools, gardening provides a mechanism, an avenue through which young people can connect to nature. What could be better, after all, for demonstrating our intricate link with the natural world than plants? which we rely on for food, medicine, flood prevention, climate regulation, and, of course, the air that we are all breathing now. And remember also, with plants, we can go one step further than connecting with nature. We can actively support it by providing that food and that habitat for wildlife. But believe it or not, plants can do even more than that. They also have an incredible capacity to take the existing school curriculum and enrich it even further, inspiring discovery in students. For me, their principal wonder lies in their beautiful chemical mechanisms, like those of the thylakoid membrane, which allow them to photosynthesize. And although I appreciate not everyone shares those interests, I do believe plants can inspire pretty much anyone. They have these obvious links with subjects like science and geography, and more subtle ones with art, history, and music. They're mathematically fascinating. Take pine cones, daisies, and broccoli. They all demonstrate, to some degree, 
Fibonacci or Lucas number patterns in their arrangements. Plants even have religious significance. Yew trees, some over 2,000 years old, are found in churchyards across this country where they're a symbol for longevity. While in Islam, heaven itself is said to be a garden. I think this tree here that I brought with me today, planted with soil from my school garden, perhaps illustrates this point the best. This, believe it or not, is not a dead stick. <laughs> it is actually an oak tree, Quercus roba, the English oak, the most common tree species in the UK. Recognizable, I imagine, to many of you, many of you perhaps when it has a few more leaves. But anyway, I wonder how many of you know that these trees can support up to 350 species of insect and harbor over 300 species of lichen on their trunks. Not only that, oaks have been deeply connected to human society for millennia. They were sacred for the Greeks, Norse, and Celts, and provided a source of wood for the Druid midsummer sacrifice. In fact, the word Druid itself is believed to be derived from the Celtic word for oak. And to this day, these trees, the oak remains deeply symbolic. It is the logo for our largest political party. While across the UK, there are 434 pubs called the Royal Oak. <laughs> But what is most amazing for me is that this tree in my hands can be planted in pretty much any school in the country where it can inspire discovery, support wildlife, and improve well-being for generations. But this effect isn't specific to the oak, or even the UK. There are similar stories in communities across the world, and these communities are starting to embrace the idea of curriculum-linked gardening. There are projects beginning from Lane County, Oregon, to Lambeth, South London. But just imagine for a moment if every school had a curriculum-linked gardening scheme. We would create an enormous network of biodiversity, well-being, and education-fostering green spaces. But we'd be doing even more than that, because we'd educate the next generation on how to manage their gardens, balconies, windowsills, their green spaces, so that these effects, these benefits, can be reaped long into the future on a much larger scale. The solution to our problems can't be to look back to some idyllic past. For better or worse, we'll never be connected to nature in the same way, in the same manner that we were before. But that doesn't mean that connecting is impossible. This proposal provides an opportunity for plants, for nature to be integrated into the schools, curriculums, and lives of the next generation. That is an opportunity that every young person deserves. Thank you very much.